Hey, you 11. Thanks so much for coming along to my webinar this evening. We're going to be looking at organic chemistry over the next hour or so. It's nice to say hi to everybody. We've got Dana, got Winkit, got Lucas, got Yi, got all of the uh, all of the normal followers, which is excellent. Thanks, guys, for coming along. I really, really appreciate it. Now, this webinar that we're going to be doing this evening, looking at organics, is going to be a it's going to be quite challenging. Possibly the biggest topic kind of I've taken on uh, since doing these webinars. Organic chemistry is a big part of your specification. I'm going to do my very best to try and get through as much of it as we can in the hour and a half of the webinar. <clears throat> I'll try. I mean, I, I really don't think I'm going to be able to get it below that, but we'll see how we get on. Okay. So I think we've got only six people watching at the moment, but the numbers tend to climb as time goes on. Tiffany's here, Lucas is here, Amir is here. Cool. Hi, Tiffany. Thanks for coming. Right. Okay. So in this webinar, uh, I've got to try and I've got to try and do something with a. In in the past, I've been focusing on being able to take out the specification points that I want to be covering. And when I started dismantling the spec, I just realized that this was enormous. The whole of organics, I should be probably doing this over three webinars rather than one. But the whole of organic chemistry is an enormous section. However, it's quite nice that I've, I've covered quite a few bits already, primarily in the industrial chemistry webinar that I've already done. So... I'm going to be referring back to the specification as often as I can, but what I want to do today is hopefully cover these key topics. I want to make sure that you guys know all of your families, and I'm going to talk you through all the families. It's nice for me to, I use the word families a lot in my lesson, but of course the actual term is homologous series, and we've got five different families that you guys need to be able to identify. However, there are six families I will talk about in the webinar. Next thing, I want to be able to use, uh, I want you guys to be able to use IUPAC, and this is the naming system. This is the naming system developed by chemists to be able to name small, relatively small alkanes and other family members. Uh, and, and of multiple families. So we can, I need to be able to apply my understanding of IUPAC to be able to name simple compounds up to, now your specification says six, but I'm gonna go up to 10. It's no difference in going from six to 10 and you'll understand why uh, from your lessons. The next thing I'm gonna cover us is transformations. And I'm really hoping that this third learning objective is gonna be really useful for you guys in year 11 because if you understand the transformations, it makes the rest of the organic chemistry seem a little bit easier. And knowing how they all relate often makes things a whole lot easier. But you'll be able to give me a bit of feedback on that and see how you find it. The next thing is be able to define key terms. So I need you guys to be realizing, and I will be highlighting all the way through this webinar, all the key words that they continuously ask about year on year. Um, and the last one is to understand polymerization in the two categories of addition and condensation polymerization. Okay, so what I did was I then took your specification points and I tried to make it a little bit simpler. So when you run through the spec, this is how it builds. We start off with crude oil, and there's a reason for that. The reason being is, of course, because all of our organic chemistry comes from crude oil. And this is where the transformations makes its first appearance. We take what we take, what we get from crude oil, and we then transform it into different families. And those families have different uses. Then we drop into our first family of alkanes, followed by alkenes, alcohols, carboxylic acids, esters, and lastly into polymers. Now, so the first thing I want to quickly do is just talk about your families or homologous series is a homologous series as you would um, know them to be called properly so we start off with alkanes and alkanes of course are the first family now i'm only going to draw one of them i'm going to draw one of these one of this family and this is ethane and you guys will be getting used to using these names 
and how we can apply our UPAC. And at this point, I drop into a t a, the first part of our UPAC, which is to mention longest chain. And we know that carbon chains can grow in length. And when they grow in length, the name changes. Now, these are the ones that you always do as a chemist. You do the first four, because after four, from five up to 10, it goes in a mathematical sequence. So one carbon in a structure gives you the IUPAC name of meth. The next one, of course, is F. Third one, three carbons in a row gives you prop, and four gives you bute. So this is the longest, otherwise known as the stem name. This is the main carbon chain that everything then belongs to. The reason why I stop at four is because once you drop into five, it becomes far more mathematical. We get pent, followed by six being hex, followed by seven, which people often make a mistake, and it's hept, and then oct, and then non, and then dec. So it's kind of, it's nice to see that I don't really need to go beyond four, because once we're into the, the sequence uh, from there, it becomes more mathematical. But the first four, of course, are odd. They don't follow the normal routine. They've got very specialized names that were given by the International Union of Pure Applied Chemists. And those do need to be learned. Please practice them. They are worthwhile doing. So the first member of my alkane family, which I always use, and I like, what I like to teach here is what's called a go-to guy. So everybody should be able to draw one member of each family and name it. This is very useful in reality because it means that you've always got somebody to go back to if you get lost. So the second family, the second family, which is the alkene family. And again, my go-to guy containing two carbons. Now notice that the structure changes and all of a sudden I pick up a carbon-carbon double bond. This is the definition for unsaturated. Here's one of our key terms that's appearing now. This is an unsaturated hydrocarbon. And the definition, hydrocarbon, and the definition for unsaturated is contains carbon-carbon double bonds. So it's quite nice that that's the revision. Contains carbon-carbon double bonds. And the definition for a hydrocarbon, everyone, of course, knows, is made from made from carbon and hydrogen and a key word being only i'll come back to that in a minute when i come to my next family now what i quickly want to do is i just want to do a counting bonds exercise the most common mistake that i see students making when it comes to drawing structures is adding too few or too many uh, hydrogens and too many is the most common so if i quickly drop in down here and here's a very common picture that i tend to see and i need to explain to you why this is wrong now this is called a displayed diagram and a displayed diagram or displayed do you know what i don't like diagram i prefer formulae for chemistry a displayed formulae and what that means is a displayed formula um and this is every atom Every atom and every bond is shown. Is shown. So it's nice to see these key words appearing. Now, what I want to do is I want to focus on why this is wrong. And the reason why is let's focus on each carbon atom. And each carbon atom, I'm just going to highlight this guy. Each carbon must make four bonds. This is a rule. This is one of our bond rules that we pick up in chemistry. The only time when that rule is broken is in graphite and graphite derivatives. And in this case, I want to show you where the bonds come from. Carb bond number one, bond number two, bond number three, bond number four, and bond number five. This has too many. So what that means is we need to get rid of somebody and that, that H will just vanish. It doesn't matter which H you take, you just remove it. Same thing with this one, too many bonds take away a H. And hence where you pick up our diagram of an alkene. Now at this point, I'm just gonna quickly mention, I'm, I'm gonna come to reactions later, but I'm just gonna quickly mention tests. Each of these families has a test. Alkanes actually don't, because they don't tend to do anything. Um, but alkenes do, and that's bromine water. I'll come back to that in the reactions section, somebody remind me. 
Okay, next family. After alkenes comes alcohols. Now, alcohols, of course, everyone knows. And it's nice just to do the recap of it. And you're going, I'm going to draw a diagram here of just R bond OH. Now, I need to mention this R. This R is any length carbon chain. Any length carbon chain. Now, you don't tend to see this an awful lot at GCSE, but at A level makes a, a heavy appearance. And I'm going to go to my go to guy. And then, of course, I'm going to go to my Friday night molecule of ethanol. So you can see where the R and the OH is coming in. And at this point, I now get to highlight this part. And you'll notice I've already highlighted the double bond. Um, and the reason why I'm doing that is because this is called a functional group. And of course, all this is essentially doing, and of course, it comes from the word function, which is that tiny part of the structure, Friday night molecule. Absolutely. Of course it is, Lucas. Absolutely. But what this functional group does is it decides, it, it, it gives chemical properties. So if I drink any substance that has an OH group, I will get drunk. That is the one of the fundamental properties of a functional group. It decides how something is going to behave. Now, give chemical properties. That's what it does. So it's nice now, of course, for me to now draw some other members of this particular family and show you how, how that relates. So I've got, let's draw the first one. This is the very first member of this family. Would you 11s? Out to you guys. Name it. I like it. Lucas, well done. Outstanding. Now, it's nice for me to do a little bit of dismantling of his name. Uh, Dana, Lucas, Amira, outstanding. Amira, don't throw propanol. Oh, and propanol. You're absolutely right. I see what you mean. You, you've named the second one. I've John. Lol. <laughs> so we've got meth. And it's nice to start doing the highlighting part of this. Meth and... Now, the an is because it's not an een. <laughs> an, and then ending with ol. So, and it's nice to highlight that section. Same thing with the next one. So, I have got prope. There's my three carbons. Prope. And you can see how the IUPAC name is, is constructed. Then we've got an, which is all carbon, carbon, single bonds, and ol, again, being the ending. It's nice for me to go to the extra extension. I've had, I've had two people name the second molecule, Amira and Lucas, and neither one have given me the A-level name. I just wonder whether people can add in the detail. There's no problem in going that extra mile. They will totally allow it. In fact, it's named in your specification, but you are allowed to simply call that propanol at GCSE. So let's see who's the first person who can give me the proper name of propanol. Well done, Lucas. Oh, oh, Lucas lost it. He, he lost, you see, isn't that interesting, Lucas? You lost your an and you need it because you can't just say prop one ol Yeah, prop one ol it's definitely not. You need the an. It's still there as part of the name. Prop an one ol So these will have similar chemical properties, similar chem props. And that's because same functional group. It provides the function. And it's just nice to see how that relates. So, and we've now had three different alcohols make an appearance there, which is really nice. Got methanol, uh, methanol, ethanol, and propanol. So if I was to have, just out of curiosity, this links back into my, the properties. If you look at my alkanes, you see my list up here. Well, we come across properties of alkanes and they, they, these, copy, these copy across. The great thing about organic chemistry is there's patterns everywhere. So if I draw methanol, if I draw methanol, if I then draw ethanol, they will all have similar chemical properties. 
Can someone now tell me? Can someone now tell me which of those uh, are the differences in terms of properties between Fopan 1 ol and Fopan 2 ol Great question, Kim. That's excellent. Um, or is that Karen? I'm never too sure. Um, the answer is there is a difference. It's just very small. And it's actually to do with the products of the reactions rather than the molecules themselves. Isn't that funny? Their physical properties are very, very, very similar. Uh, but it's the products that they create that, that tend to differ. Great question. So can I ask folks, out of all of these, can anyone tell me which one is going to have the lowest boiling point? Lowest BPT. It drops us into properties and we're linking the properties back to our alkane family in terms of, I don't want to give it away. Which one has the lowest boiling point? Lucas put, I like it, first one. I like it. Thanks, guys. Absolutely spot on. So the lowest is going to be methanol. And the reason being, oh, guys, impress me, year 11s. Why? Go on. Okay, Lucas, you've gained one mark. One mark from a three-mark question. Why has that got the lowest? Because it has less carbons. One mark, Amiri, you'll gain that. Shortest chain, smallest molecule. Weaker wimps, absolutely. Well done. Weaker wimps, spot on. Weaker wimps, weakened molecular forces, therefore less energy to break them. So it always come back to energy. Don't ever forget that, but otherwise that's really good. Wimps are weaker. Perfect. Doesn't take much energy to break the bonds. Spot on. Try not to say bonds. Try to say wimps. Always better. Therefore, lower boiling point. Darn it. Great chemistry. Well done. So at this point, uh, I'm sticking with this family. It is nice now. If you notice my, my notes up here that I made before the lesson, I, I was doing isomers. I was realizing that these were all the isomer questions that I'd been coming across. Uh, in all the papers. There was an isomer question on alkanes, an isomer question on alkenes, and an isomer question on alcohols. I didn't see any others, and it's nice then just to quickly talk about isomers. So isomers, this has a definition. Molecules with, molecules with the same Molecular formula, molecular formulae, but different structural formulae. I just want to show you what that means. So, and here's the question, which is if I give us, uh, if I give us C4H. 10 butane those people in my class will recognize these questions the first isomer you should always draw is the straight chain version and this is of course butane and then what we can do is we can always branch it add bits take pull bits off and put them on somewhere else so there is methylpropane so this isomer they have the same formula same molecular same four carbons, same 10 hydrogens, but they are arranged differently in their structure. So that was a very common one in terms of branching. This is called a branched isomer. And then we then pick up just to do another one, which is then they gave you a diagram. Instead of giving you a formula, they then give you a picture. And they give you this one. Notice how I'm counting on my bonds. I'm counting all the time year 11 non-stop and now i've got my alkene and i can say that is butuanine and i can actually reposition that double bond this is actually called a position isomer that's now butuene i've just moved the double bond over to the middle just to now show you people often think that this is another one and it's not the reason being is that this one is exactly the same as that one. It's just turned around. 
I thought you don't break the bonds. Uh, I thought you don't you don't break the bonds. You break the wimps. Should never say breaking bonds. So nice to see that those these guys here are the same. So that's a position isomer. It's nice to me for, for me to give you one more. So I can also do. I'm just going to give you the alcohol one. Again, it's another position. That's propan one -ol, but we know that we can move our functional group, our bit that decides the chemical properties. I can move that onto carbon number two to give me propan two -ol. So nice that. Usual thing, we see this kind of repeating pattern. We're moving things, we're breaking bits off. So we're busy working through our families. So we've now covered alkanes, alkenes, and alcohols. Now, I, I said to you at the start of this webinar that there are five, five, five families that you're expected to know. However, they always show you six. So the next family, now year 11, you do not need to be able to name this family, but it's nice to tell you about it. This is the halo alkane family. Any one of you year 11s, that has been doing exam papers will have seen these. You don't need to name them, but uh, it's actually it's not it's it's not on your specification at all. But they keep making an appearance, and I'm worried that they'll do this to you. So I don't know why I wouldn't teach the family. And this is now halo alkane is the family because it tells you where the halogen goes that the group seven goes. So this here is chloroethane. So you can see that the chlorine attachment has become an O, hence halo in the family name has become chloro, and then you add on your your uh, your chain name. Another example, one that comes up on a regular basis. This is dibromoethane. It's quite a nice one. I'll give the names of these. That is chloro. Oh, already done it. Chloroethane, and this one is 1,2-dibromo. The halogen becomes a prefix. They are formed from substitution reactions, right? Absolutely, Lucas. I'm coming to the reactions shortly. 1,2-dibromoethane. And that's a nice family because you can move them around very easily. Uh, even though you're not expected to really name them or know them, they just keep making an appearance, and hence why I want to cover it. Right, after alcohol family... After the alcohol family comes the carboxylic acid family. Now, you'll notice that carboxylic acid. Now, you'll notice with the alcohol, just going to put alcohol over here, had R bond OH. Carboxylic acids have something similar. R bond and a structure which, which you need to all recognize. Double bond O bond OH. That structure is the structure of a carboxylic acid. So if I tack that onto anything, it relates a certain set of properties. So if I draw my go-to guy, and you'll notice that most of them are Fs, and this is F-anoic acid. There's a whole load of reasons why I preferred the Fs. F is two carbons. Then I get an. The single bond means it's an an. And then oic acid coming from this entire section. So ethan oic acid. That structure comes, that name comes from that structure. And that's really important. You've got to recognize these structures in organic chemistry. So the reason why, I've, of course, I latch on to the Fs is because they're very common. Ethanol is the one that we drink, although in your exam, you're going to write down fuels. And ethanol onto food. Um, uh, its other name, vinegar is the household name. Its common name is acetic acid. So it's quite nice to give you actual common names. So, but it's nice to realize what it contains and giving its IUPAC name. Am I the only one lagging? He's gone. Uh oh. Oh no. Uh, I don't know if I'm back. 
He's gone. Oh no. We see your ceiling. Oh, it's done it again. <laughs> oh, oh, sorry. Okay. Can you see me now? Nice lights. Just realize I, I keep what's happening is I keep clicking accidentally. Oh, hi, you're there. I am. Hello. Uh <laughs> let's bring that back. There we go. I just need to do hide and I keep hitting it with my hand, I think. Okay. So it's nice to mention our carboxylic acids. So at this point, I feel like as as we go through this, I realize very quickly how much this builds. And our organic families, it looks like gamic. Don't like that. Organic families. So far, we have alkanes. We have alkenes. Capitalized it, shouldn't. We have alcohols. We have carboxylic acids. And we've picked up a new one. It's not a new one. You know about it. It's just not expected for you guys to know it on your spec, but it keeps appearing. And these are haloalkanes. Haloalkanes. I need to make my pen a little bit. So this is what we've done so far. The last thing we see is Mr. Duncan's face. Thanks, Wayne Kit. Why is my... Uh, 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 uh. Wayne Kit, what is the difference between isopropyl A and methyl ethyl A? Yeah, Wink it, you're doing old naming. You need to come and ask me about that specifically tomorrow, and I'll fill you in. You don't need it anymore. Iso isopropanol is propantuol. They got rid of the iso because it was confusing people because they didn't know how to use it. They replaced it with a better naming system called IUPAC. Our last family, our last family is esters. Now, what I'm going to do at this point, those are our five families. And what I want you guys to realize is why they've done this. There is a reason. Uh, I'm just going to quickly drop into, I've done my carboxylic acids. I'm going to drop into my esters. So I've, I've shown my, est, my carboxylic acid of choice. I'm going to do my ester of choice. I'm going to try and make my pen a little bit, a bit thicker. So my ester of choice is ethylethanoate. It just, it's easy. It's got the E in it again. And, but it, it does actually. Actually, it does things easy for me. I chose it because it was two and two, and I liked the twos, it was helpful. I want to show you where the name is built from, <clears throat> and also the relationship to our families, because the ester family is a combination of two other families. So we started, this started life out as a, it's not the way to do it. It started life out as a carboxylic acid, and this bit here, is screaming at me carboxylic acid. Let's break this in half and turn it back into what it was originally. So there's my oh, it. You can see the structure that has been passed on. This is like having kids. You pass on your genes. In organic chemistry, you pass on structures. And this is passed on to the ester. And it was also then made, secondly, from an alcohol. And there's my alcohol that I started like, and this was ethanol. So, I think because of its usefulness and continuity for names, but it does allow me to easily see how they're related because it matches up with my other guys. Now, when these two react together, I'm gonna to come to the reactions soon, uh, but I just wanted to show, talk you through all the different families. And, Esters is a relatively new addition. It's not actually a relatively new addition to GCSE, but it seems to be coming up a few, a little bit more. And a GCSE question, just going to show you one, would be something like, um, it would be something like this. And they would ask you to name the alcohol and carboxylic acid. I think this was the last one that appeared on the exam. I'll even be good and put on H's. Can someone tell me the carboxylic acid that I used to make this, please? Whilst I finish my H's off, I'll be thorough today on the webinar. So what was my carboxylic acid and what was my alcohol? And if anybody's here who can work it at the A-level standard, I'd like to see you give me the alcohol at the A-level level, if you can. 
Donna said aminoic acid. So there's your first mistake. What I'm going to do is I'm going to box off my oic. Donna, can you see your can you see your error? Carbon one, carbon two, and carbon three. This originally was propanoic acid. Prop, of course, you, yeah, absolutely, Lucas. Well done. Propanoic acid started life out. C double bond O bond O H. This is called esterification, by the way, when you combine them. What was the alcohol used to make it? Well done, Lucas. Outstanding. Winkit just put bottle. Nice one, Winkit. Bottle. It almost sounds like something else, doesn't it, eh, Winkit? So there's my butan one or GCSE butanol. And it, I'm just picking it up in terms of the number of carbons. Thank you, Winkit. That's better. Remove water. And you'll form your ester. So it's just nice to talk you through a few kind of common questions regarding our families. So what that now means is, in terms of my lesson objective, we have covered all of our families and the naming system, which is quite nice. And now it's going to lead me straight into... Now, I know that the list looks massive, and I'm going to come back to this a lot. I can also say that we've covered isomers. And I'm going to heavily go through that in a minute. But what I want to now go to is transformations. This is something you may not have heard in the lesson and of which I really do love. And it explains what Edexcel are doing and the choices they have made. So we start off life from crude oil. Everything starts off here. We, but we, we dig it up, it's a black sticky liquid. We sell it in barrels, yeah, and it's nasty stuff. And this is a mixture, a mixture of alkanes. And this is where our first family came from. So from crude oil comes alkanes. And we get this through one process, one very simple process. Can anyone tell me what that process is, please? What process do we use? Do you form esters from condensation polymerization? You form polyesters, Luca, Lucas, not individual esters, but you form polyesters. Donna, no, overthought it. You've skipped. This is Donna. I'm really hoping that me going through these transformations is going to make things a whole lot easier and simpler. And you'll realize there's a pattern and a, there's a progression to this. Edexcel haven't been stupid. I actually like them for this one, which is we start off the crude oil and we frack this to get our alkanes. And we get our first family. I'm going to draw butane. I should draw my go-to guy, really, of ethane. But I'm going to draw butane in this particular setting. So there's butane. That's what we get from crude oil. And we get a mixture of them. Get loads of them. They're all fuels. We burn every single one of them. There's not really much we can do with alkanes except for burning them. And when we burn in them, we cause horrendous trouble. But that's where everything began. This was family Number one, this was the one that everything else comes from. And what, of course, we then discovered is that you can take an alkane and we could transform it. And this is our very first transformation. And I'm going to come back to Dana and say, Dana, what process do we need to use to change this to my second family, which is an alkene? At this point, my go-to alkene appears. Ethene. Donna will give me that one. This is a, by the way, fractional distillation is a five mark question. Thank you very much, Donna. The five mark question for fractional distillation we vaporize the crude oil. We feed that vapor into the tower. The tower has a temperature gradient. It is hot at the bottom and warm at the top. Bigger molecules have higher boiling points due to stronger, weak intermolecular forces. The bigger molecules condense lower down in the tower, and the shorter molecules condense near the top. Five marks. We now learned in the 1950s, actually it was 40s, we learned to crack. So we now do cracking. And at this point, I, nice, I get to refer back to my previous webinar, my webinar of industrial processes. Six 
100 degrees Celsius. It's very, very hot. A zeolite catalyst. So there's our industrial process of cracking. And we transform the alkane family into an alkene family. We also get as a by, by the way, the alkene, funnily enough, is actually a byproduct. What we also get and what everyone else realizes here is why do we perform cracking? We perform cracking because the supply of short chains, shorter, the supply of short chains is less than the demand. So, so I am, the supply is less than, yes. So we had to make more of it. So we took a long chain and we cracked it. Right, Julian, wasn't it aluminium or silica catalyst? Uh, Julian, right, this is why I don't like giving alumina as the catalyst. You're allowed to say alumina and you're allowed to say silica. I'd recommend you to do neither. Isn't it 700? Lucas, six, I like 600. It's an easy number. It's my first number I went to. Uh, but the catalyst that you learn at A level is zeolite. And I'd recommend learning that one. But you can say alumina if you wish. So we've now transformed our alkanes into alkenes. Now, this makes total sense in terms of how Edexcel have structured this. We roll from alkanes into alkenes. And this is because they're the first family that we transformed them into. We then learned to transform the alkene family into two new families. So the first one, and the one I'm going to focus on primarily, is alcohols. We can now transform the alkene family into the alcohol family. There is a second route, whereas we can turn it into the haloalkane family. Now, you don't need to know that family, folks, but you keep seeing it. And every single person watching this webinar will recognize these molecules, where all of a sudden the group seven atom will appear on it. Even though you won't be expected to name it, it's, it's on the specification. As, sorry, it's not on the specification, which means they can't ask you to name it, but they seem to ask you to do it anyway. It's very frustrating. And so just be aware so, my question to you, Year 11, what do we add to alcohols to turn them into al Sorry, what do we add to alkenes to turn them into alcohols? Off you go. First person. What do I add to alkenes to convert them to alcohols? Lucas, you're wrong. You'll kick yourself, Lucas, uh, when you get the answer. Your answer, Lucas, is good, but you won't get the mark in the exam. Is this in double award or triple award? Great question. Let me check. The answer is it's in, it's in, hang on, I can tell you. And look, even though this family is now, I'm now focusing onto your specification here. Alkenes, unsaturated, describe the reactions of alkenes with bromine to form dibromoalkanes. Add bromine water to distinguish between alkanes and alkenes, but alcohols, so anyone in double award doesn't need this. What do we add? We do add, you know, uh, hydration of alkenes forms alcohols. Yes, okay, and that's correct. But what are we adding? You still haven't answered my question. So, like water vapor, that's correct. I will give you water vapor, and the answer is steam. Lucas, I apologise with your me saying that you were wrong with water, but you are because you have to say steam. It won't react with water, but it will react with steam because water's a liquid, so they won't collide properly. We need them to be gases. If we want to transform them into a haloalkane, let's have a look at one particular. So if we take ethene, and in fact, I'm going to color code this and do it properly. So if I now go into red, you'll, you'll understand why. And then drop back into black. You can see the water that I have added. The water, of course, is in, 
The steam, of course, is in red. And half of it's gone onto one carbon and half it's come onto another. I'll go on to those reactions shortly. And as a haloalkane, when you react an alkene with a halogen, such as bromine, in an addition reaction, so I can now add Br2, bromine water, which is orange, and I will end up with this. Di bromo, those able students, one, two, di bromo. You don't need the one, two at GCSE, but it's nice to have it. One, two, di bromo ethane. Now that transformation isn't asked directly, but it's nice to know it. No, Lucas, that's not done under UV light. I've missed a transformation. I've missed one. Thanks, Lucas. Alkanes can also be transformed into haloalkanes. I've missed a transformation. So I can take ethane. I should have put in ethane. I can take ethane and I can transfer, I can transform it into chloroethane using chlorine gas and the condition is UV light. I've missed the transformation. Isn't that shocking? Hate that. So you can see what's going on here. We can take an alkane and we can add chlorine and UV light and we will substitute. This is a substitution reaction. I'll add that. That is a substitution reaction. And this one is an addition reaction addition reaction because substitution in the halo alkanes i feel like i want to draw that again here is my ethane i always like going back to my go-to guy it's always nice i'm gonna add that to let's do let's do bromine water i, I shouldn't do it let's do chlorine and i hit this with uv light uv light's needed because without it there's not enough energy to break the bonds because alkanes are very stable. What I will sub, I, this is a substitution, because what I'm going to do is I'm going to substitute a H for a Cl. So I'm going to form our chloroalkane and our byproduct of HCl. Ah, oh, made an error, swap that out, and HCl is our byproduct. So this is a substitution reaction because I've swapped it out. UV light is needed. Next. The addition reaction, of course, the bromine water, with alkenes, they're much more reactive, so no UV light is needed. This is another one of our industrial processes, which is alkenes plus steam to form alcohols. This is one of our industrial processes we need. This is done at 300 degrees Celsius at uh, 60 atmospheres with a concentrated, concentrated, Phosphoric acid catalyst. Ugh, isn't that horrible? Acid catalyst, cat. So there's another industrial process appearing. Right. So you, we've now got four of our families on the board out of our six. Now, why did we then evolve to carboxylic acids? Because that's our next transformation. We can now turn acids into the carboxylic acid family. And how do we do that? Let's have a quick look. We started life as ethanol. And I turn it into ethanoic acid. And there's two ways of doing this. Method number one, you'll notice I changed my color. Method one is oxidation. Oxidation with air. So if you leave a bottle of wine open, it'll turn into vinegar. This is why when you're out for a meal and next time you're out with your parents and your parents try the wine at the dinner table, you can ask them, why do you taste the wine and see whether or not they actually know the real reason. And the real reason is to check to see if it's been left open to air and it has turned into vinegar. There is method number two. Method Now, the problem is method number one is very slow. Method number two is quicker because us chemists don't like slow reactions. We want it to be really quick. So we now do oxidation with potassium dichromate. 
and I apologize for the complicated name, but you do need to know this, and potassium dichromate starts off, if you take, so if I just quickly do the practical, if you take ethanol, colorless ethanol, and I add potassium dichromate, K2Cr2O7, it will become orange because potassium dichromate is orange. It'll turn orange. We then add a small amount of acid and what it will do is it will turn green. And that observation you do need to know. So if you add potassium dichromate, you will oxidize it. It'll change color from orange to green. What makes carboxylic acids acidic? Great question. Okay, what makes carboxylic acids acidic? So I'm gonna drop out of the right transformation diagram momentarily and drop down here. I'm trying to find space on my notes. Right, zoom in. So carboxylic, this is from Kayun, I think. So carbo, I'm gonna make my pen fatter. So my carboxylic acid family is an, we know that acids are, hey, produce H+. If I put that into water, it will fall apart. And it will fall apart to become this. And there is my acid. We know that all acids produce H+. And that's the, that's the H+, that it releases when it's in water. So that's what makes it acidic. Great question. And by the way, it's also weak since it's uh, not all of it. Just, it's not fully ionized. Comes straight out of acid base theory at GCSE. Right, let's see if we can get back up here, back to my transformations. So, guys, you can see that there's a pattern here. We've gone from alkane to alkene to alcohol to oic. We're slowly moving through our families. And the final family that Edexcel decided to use and to put in is a family that combines ols and oics. If you take an alcohol and you add a carboxylic acid, you will form an ester. It's our last transformation. We take the oic. We take the oic. Oh, I'm going to try and do something really, really cool here. We take the carboxylic acid. We react it with the alcohol in the presence of concentrated sulfuric acid or any concentrated acid. And you can see what's going to happen just to show you where all the atoms have gone. So I've got the green as the carboxylic acid and I'll put the red as the alcohol. So you can see what's happened, that there's, in fact, I don't like putting it there. I'd prefer to put this, to make this a little bit easier to see, try and reorganize to make this easier to understand. There is the, I'm gonna try and do that in a different color so we can see that the water's being formed. I should do water in blue, shouldn't I? Oh, that's such a good idea. I'm such a nerd. Right, let's do that. There's the carboxylic acid. So you can see this, I can divide it up. We can see that I have the carboxylic acid there. I have the alcohol here. And when they come together, water forms, water forms and they link together and the water drops out and we form our ester. Now esters, of course, properties of esters, they are used as artificial smells and flavorings. So artificial smells, artificial, oh, I'm gonna mess with that. Artificial smells and flavors and flavs. It is also, they are also solvents, super glue, and they are also plasticizers. They soften plastics. So nice use of esters. And that brings us to the end of our transformations. It's a very lovely picture when you actually start putting it all together into one. And you can see what edX can esters be toxic? 
Oh, that's a very good question, Lucas. Um, I've never come across a toxic ester um, because when you come across ones that you eat, smell, and taste, they're all non-toxic. I don't see why not, but I've never come across one. I, I'd like to say no, but I don't know. Lucas, outstanding question. No, they're non-toxic. Are there natural sources of esters, like apples containing some chemicals like apple flavors and esters? Yes. Um, okay, and the esters, it, ap all fruits, all naturally occurring uh, fruits and veg produce esters, and those esters are what give them their flavors. And we just realized that we could produce them synthetically. So yes, the esters are what give them their flavors. They also produce much more complex molecules. Which produce, the, which produce something similar, but yes, they all produce a, a, an esters of some. Reiterating a question, what makes carboxylic acids acidic? Sarah. Sarah, carboxylic acids are acidic. Did I not answer that question? I clearly didn't do that very well. When you put a carboxylic acid into water, add to water, add H2O, they will dissociate. They ionize. They ionize in water, in H2O, to produce H+, plus, which is acidic, which is what makes an acid an acid. I, I don't know what I've done wrong there. Isn't that a lovely map? Alkanes, alkenes, to alcohols, to oics, and then to esters. And I, I can see exactly why Edexcel have done what they have done so it ionizes partially like a weak acid. Yes, absolutely, spot on. All carboxylic acids are weak. They all partially ionize in water. Right, at this point, I go back to here. So the properties of alkanes, I'm gonna link this to everybody. The properties that they want you to know is to, and to talk about are boiling point, viscosity, viscosity and oh uh hang on boiling point and color yeah interesting boiling point viscosity and color as the chains get longer their boiling point increases so the long chain the higher the boiling point as they get longer their viscosity increases same reason stronger weak intermolecular forces so their ability to move over each other uh becomes worse so they slow down it becomes darker as you don't go down the group. Right, at this point, you can see all these various words that I've got in here, and I'm going to drop into, at this point, reactions. Right, so you guys need to know, of all the reactions, you guys need to know combustion reactions. Combustion. So this is X plus O2 goes to... And in combustion, CO2 and water, or carbon monoxide and water, or carbon and water. And we know that these two here are incomplete, and this is complete. And we can then specify why. So this has got excess oxygen, so more than enough oxygen. This is not enough. It's uh, insufficient, not enough oxygen not enough o2 and this is really not a lot <clears throat> really not enough oxygen isn't that entertaining not enough o2 so and then of course we come across all of the problems that this relates to carbon dioxide is global warming carbon monoxide is toxic binds permanently to hemoglobin so you can't carry oxygen and carbon particulates causing global dimming nice to put global warming then it goes toxic, and then we do global dimming. The particles get in the dust, the black dust that is carbon solid, gets into the atmosphere and blocks the sun. Balance as required. The combustions are relatively straightforward. I do at this point want to point out another one. You can burn sulfur, and you can burn sulfur because sulfur is an impurity in fuels, and that will, of course, make SO2. SO2 reacts with, oh, I wonder if I can do this as a nice train. SO2 reacts with H2O to form acid rain.
Uh, I'm, I'm just going to put acid rain there. Acid rain. So nice to see that. So sulfur can also combust. We can also burn nitrogen. Now this, by the way, is, I need to talk to you about this on N at X. Right. So there are a couple of things that cause acid rain, including SO2 and NOx. NOx, of course, means that it's nitrogen monoxide or nitrogen dioxide. Both of, the, both of them are produced. So I can sum it up with the NOx. If I was going to balance it, I'd put one in. I always tend to go with NO because it's easier to balance. <laughs> it's just simpler. Now, this reaction, everyone knows that the air you're breathing, the air you're breathing right now contains 78% nitrogen and 21% oxygen. Yet these don't react. The reason being, it's nice to do some really good chemical bonding. Nitrogen is a triple bond, very strong triple bond. Well, hard like me, very strong triple bond. Triple bond. And oxygen is O double bond. It's pretty strong, not as strong as the nitrogen. Strong double bond. In order to get these two to react, we need crazy high temperatures, high temps. And that temperature is achieved in a car engine. Cars do get hot enough to achieve that. And that's one of the marking things for Excel. Nitrogen, monox nitrogen oxides are producing car engines because the temperature is high enough to get nitrogen oxygen to react. It actually requires more than that, yeah, in car engine. It actually requires a spark. Those people going to A level, high temperatures isn't enough. You have to say it happens at the spark plug because you need lightning to split that, bolt, that, split that bond. It's very, very tough. But at GCSC, you need high temperatures. So that covers combustion. The next one we want to do is I want to cover, I, I've already technically covered substitutions, but I will focus on it a bit more, find a space to do it. So we know that alkanes, going back to my good old go-to guy of ethane, I can now react this with any halogen I like, fluorine, chlorine, bromine, or iodine, in the presence of UV light, and I will form, I will swap a H for whoever I wanted. And the byproduct is always an acid. You just put the H and whatever's left over together. So that there is called a substitution reaction because I'm swapping. It is the swap of a H for a Cl. Hence why it's called a sub, sub reaction. And we only tend to see those, of course, for the alkanes. Next ones. We never, what we come across are addition reactions. Now, these are more important. These come up more frequently at GCSE, addition reactions. And this is all about our friendly folk of alkenes, our second family, which we get from cracking. Now, the great thing is, about why does it only work in UV light? Julian, the reason being is, if you... The bond that you're trying to break, now you don't know this at GCSE. Oh, no, you do. Do you remember when you did energetics and you covered bond strength? The carbon-hydrogen bond has a bond strength of 412 kilojoules per mole. That's a very tough bond. Trying to break off a H is very difficult. This is not easy. In order to break that off, you need very high energies and, uh, and, and you require something that's gonna have a bit of a punch to it. And what we use is we use UV light in order to create things that will be able to rip off a H. It, it requires a bit more of an explanation than you have at GCSE. In order to break that bond, oh, I, I won't go there. It's, it's too far into A level and I won't bother. Come and ask me tomorrow, Julian, if you're interested. The UV light provides the activation energy. How about that? To break the original bond. Fine. Also, for alkenes, can you call it halogenation for an addition reaction of a halogen? Do you know what, Sarah? You should be allowed because halogenation, the definition of halogenation is adding halogens. So if you say halogenation to an alkene, that's correct because it means adding halogens. But you can't say halogenation of an alkene because it's a substitution. Sorry, you have to say substitution of a halogen. It's horrible with a halogen. Really mean that, isn't it? Um, 
I hope that helps, Julian, because the masking says no. Ha! That's amazing. You should be allowed. But I understand why they don't. They want you to say an addition reaction. Isn't that interesting? So stay away from it. Stick with addition. <laughs> you should be allowed to, but anyway. So an addition reaction, we know that when I break that double bond, and you can see, I'm going to try and do this in like a stepwise diagram. When we snap open this double bond, what happens is the bond will swing open and we can now add things to this. We can add stuff in, X and Y, hence why they're called addition reactions. When we do this, when we, when we do this, and the, so the scenarios that we come across at GCSE, and I'll do both simultaneously. So we start off with our alkene, and what we add is two things. Number one is add steam, and notice how I draw the water, H2O with an actual structure. We can also, I'm going to move that plus because it's too close in my opinion. We can also add, let's do bromine water. It's always a good one. So we've got steam and bromine water. And then what we realize is going to happen is we're going to, the double bond is going to break open and I'm going to attach them across that double bond. The H here goes on to the, ah, darn it. The H there. Uh, I'm not doing it, my laptop's having a hiccup. My H here will go there, and the rest of it, the OH, joins onto here. So there's the formation of ethanol. Doesn't look very nice, that, does it? And then with the bromine, it's exactly the same. Double bond breaks open. Notice that I'm deliberately not showing my H's because I want to show the attachments and color coding it. That bromine goes here, and that bromine goes here. So it's nice to see what they're doing. They're just going across the double bond. You can do more additions than this, but those are the main ones that you need to know. Okay. Going back to my notes at the very, very top. So we've covered substitutions of halogens with UV light. We've covered cracking, given the temperatures to produce alkenes and shorter alkanes, supply versus demand. Alkenes, we've covered addition reactions and isomers moving the double bond. We're going to come across polymerization in a minute. Alcohols we've covered. We make them from ethene and steam. I will also mention fermentation. Yeast, 30 degrees, all that jazz. But we did that in the industrial one. We've done isomers being propan 1 or propan 2 -ol. We did oxidation with air and potassium dichromate to form carboxylic acids. Right. On, uh, by the way, okay, next. I like it. Neutralizations. This is why I'm, I've got all these notes prepared. Okay. So the next one, the next reaction, um, totally lost with all my notes here they're just they're just going everywhere okay let's go over to here and go neutralization this you, you so this is definitely something that's worthwhile looking over so carboxylic acids are acidic this is neutralizing neutralizing a carboxylic acid okay so carboxylic acids Go to our go-to guy. It's always good to have someone you go back to all the time. Your strength, you're reinforcing those. I've done, I've done this before. I've drawn this before. I know this molecule. Nitrogen oxide reacted water to form acid rain. Which acid are which acids are formed? You're forming a type of nitrous acid, not nitric, but nitrous. But you don't need to know it. All you need to say, Kayun, is you form acid rain. I can give you the equation for that if you like, but you do not need it. It's similar to the one with sulfuric acid. So, neutralizing carboxylic acids. Now, on your specification, it specifically says by adding a metal, which is really bizarre why they choose this, but they have. They're saying that we can, carboxylic acids are acids, and they will react with metals. So if I react this with sodium, sodium metal, they will react. What am I gonna form? Metal mash, a mirror. Metal plus acid gives salt and hydrogen. I say a mirror because she said it today, which is really nice. So mash. So okay, I've got my metal. 
I've got my acid. What's my salt? Now that's tricky. Let's have a look at what this does. So what now happens is I'm going to form hydrogen and we know which hydrogen I'm going to lose. We know that the reason why carboxylic acids are acidic is because of that H. That H is going to disappear as hydrogen gas. So I now get sodium ethanoate, and I know you don't have to name the salts, folks. You don't have to do it. You just need to know the observations. That's it. And I feel like I want to do the whole equation. I'm going to do the whole thing, folks. I'm going to do the whole equation. Sorry. Sorry, 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 sorry. I'm running out of time. I know an hour has already passed. So let's do carboxylic acids. My laptop is having a real hissy fit. So carboxylic acid, carboxylic acid plus metal, like sodium. And I now form so sodium. You don't need to be able to do this, folks, but it's technically on your specification, annoyingly, and hydrogen gas. You can, I, I'm sure they'd allow you to do this. I'm sure they'd allow you to just do that and then double the equation. And then you get two H's. Uh, sorry, what does MASH stand for? Metal plus acid. MASH stands for metal plus acid gives salt and hydrogen. It's just an easy way of remembering one of the, my, my laptop is really, it's, it's having this, it's having a proper hissy fit here. It really is metal, metal, there we go. Metal plus acid gives salt and hydrogen mash, that's all. Um, that equation you do not need to know, you don't. But I just wanna show it to you on the mark scheme because it's there. And there it is. Describe the reactions. Describe the reactions of aqueous solutions of carboxylic acids with metals and metal carbonates. Right, describe. No equations are needed. And the answer is both will fizz. You are adding an acid to a base, to a metal or a metal car. If you add any acid, if you add an acid to a carbonate, any carbonate, sodium carbonate, I don't care what it is, you will make bubbles of CO2. It will fizz, plus salt and water. I, I have to do it, sorry. If you do acid, even if it's vinegar, we'll do it, plus metal, you will make hydrogen gas and salt, and you will see bubbles, you will see fizzing. So it doesn't matter if it's a carboxylic acid or not. Yo, if you put an equal sign in an equation, I will will have to kill you. Please don't do it. It's an arrow. I know that you don't have an arrow on your laptop, but you could have. Yo, you should have done this. Yeah, that's what you should have done. <laughs> Can be done. Okay, so it's just nice to cover carboxylic acid reactions and neutralizations. It can be done. Esters, we've covered. We've done esters, making them from acids and alcohols using our concentrated acid as our catalyst. And now we're going to drop into polymers. So, okay. Now, this is tough. Everyone struggles with these. So, I'm just going to now, I've, I've managed to lose my notes altogether. It's my laptop is slowing right down. I don't really know why. It's because the notes are getting heavy. Right. My next title will be polymers. Okay, folks. We're nearly done, I promise. There are two types of polymers. There are addition polymers addition polymers otherwise known uh, made from alkenes alkenes to polyalkenes and then we also have condensation polymers second type two families i don't like how big that is oh, my laptop is not responding Condensation polymers. These are polyesters. And these are polyesters. The only family you need. It's nice. So 
at this point, we go from, and, and it says addition from, I shouldn't do that. I should say from diols reacting with dioic acids to form polyesters. Now, I think what I'm going to do is, it's 10 past 8 now. I don't want to make this webinar go on and on. I'm going to schedule a second webinar specifically for polymers. I think that's worthwhile. I think people will benefit from that. So I come back to that on a separate webinar. I'll schedule that for season three. And instead, what I'm going to do is, I'm going to, we've come across two key terms, saturation, addition, polymerization, cracking, substitution, combustion. I'm going to come back to that on a separate webinar. We'll do polymers separately. I'm going to go through our, our uh, questions, our preliminary work, and go through this. So, first thing, question number one, state why each of these compounds is a hydrocarbon. All the above molecules are made from only hydrogen and carbon, covered in today's webinar. I'm sorry, folks. That does, I feel like it's doing, it seems to be hopping backwards and forwards. Yeah, I'm, I'm pressing it, and it doesn't really know what I'm doing. I'm nearly there. There we go. State why the formula given for D is called a displayed formula. All bonds are shown and all atoms are shown. Very clear. Give the letter that represents four compounds with the general formula C2, H2N plus 2. CNH2N plus 2. So that's an alkane. So A is an alkane. B is an alkene. So I've doubled it but no add 2. I have doubled it and added 2 for that one. I have doubled it and added 2 for that one. I haven't for that one. And I have for that one. So D and a, C, D, and E. A, C, D, and F. Balance for complete combustion. They do not need to tell you what the products are because they've done it in our complete combustion. That is always carbon dioxide and water. So we just run those in and don't forget your 11 to balance. Next, explain, why the, why, explain how the combustion of shale gas can lead to the formation of acid rain. It was in the question previously. I thought that was quite clever. Many of the compounds and uh, shale gas contains many different compounds, including blah, 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 and hydrogen sulfide. So I put shale gas hates H2S as an impurity. When burnt, it forms SO2. SO2 reacts with rain to form uh, re uh, reacts with rainwater to form acid rain, and they gave an equation. Please be careful, Year Eleven. Please, please, please. I've given you an equation there purely for thoroughty there. Not even a word, but that is not sulfuric acid. That is sulfurous acid. Yeah, sulfuric acid is H2SO4. And if it rained that, your face would melt off, which is lucky, really, and why it's lucky that it's sulfurous and not sulfuric. Again, my laptop is struggling to cope with this. It's, it's extremely hot. My laptop is roasting. Cool, let's go to question two. State why yeast is added. It is a catalyst for the reaction, and it therefore increases the rate of reaction. Seems reasonable enough. Uh, the next thing is explain why in the absence at 30 degrees in the absence of air. Yeast is, oh, okay. Explain why if air is present, then you don't make ethanol, you make CO2 and water. Right, explain why another organic compound may be formed in fermentation if there's presence of air. The ethanol will oxidize, it will react with the oxygen to form ethanoic acid. We came across that in our transformations in the webinar. Explain why 30 degrees is considered the optimum temperature. Lower means a slower reaction. Higher denatures enzymes and the whole process stops. Done this in my webinar, ethene plus steam gives ethanol. Name the type of reaction. It is a hydration or you could also call it an addition because, of course, we're putting in an alkene. State two conditions from industry, 300 degrees, 60 atmospheres. Right, here's our ester. So they've given us a nasty ester. And here's my oic structure. What that means is that this section here is my oic. Well, this is such a, that my laptop is really causing me trouble. There. There's my oic, and here's my alcohol. There's my alcohol. So three carbons in the oic, that's prop and oic acid. Four carbons in my alcohol, 
butanol one all or butanol for GCSE. Next. Which ones represent hydrocarbons with the ge alkene general formula? B and E. State why B is the only hydrocarbon shown as a displayed. It's the only one showing all the bonds and all the atoms. State why two letters represent isomers. Right. One carbon, two carbons, three carbons, none of them are isomers because they need the same molecular formula, different structural. Four carbons, three carbons. Oh, are C and E isomers? Ah, oh, no, they're not. Three, four, five, six. That's got six H's, but this has this has eight H's, not isomers. No. Next, four. Oh, are these two isomers? And the answer is yes. Same number of carbons, same number of hydrogens. Next, clever that. Different structure. How many of the four hydrocarbons are members of the of the homologous series alkanes? A alkane, C alkane, D alkane, F alkane, or can you be an isomer if one has a has a double bond and another has a single bond? Yo, okay. The answer is yes. Let me show you an example. Yo, this is propene. It's not my go-to guy. But near to it, only one extra carbon. Would you agree? C three H six. This is cyclopropane. Look at the formula. C three H six. They have the same molecular formula, but different structural formula. Yes. Cyclopropane. These are isomers. Fact. Same molecular formula, different structural formula. And if I wanted to tell them apart, if I had two test tubes with them in it, and if I had a test tube with cyclopropane in and one with propene in, I would add bromine water, orange bromine water to both. And what would happen is the alkene would turn colorless and the al the cycloalkene will remain orange no change alkane yeah nice to say the difference nice to do chemical tests next many hydrocarbons are fuels their problems are associated explain why combustion can lead to the uh, production of a toxic gas Lack of, com lack, lack of oxygen results in incomplete combustion. One of the products of incomplete combustion is carbon monoxide, and carbon monoxide is toxic. So what are the marks for that, folks? They stand out very clearly. Lack of oxygen, incomplete combustion, produces carbon monoxide, carbon monoxide is toxic. Four marks, even though it's only two, you're gonna save a lot. State why this gas is poisonous. Binds to hemoglobin, so it can't carry oxygen. Explain how the combustion of these fuels leads to, uh, even if the sulfur has been removed, why does it still result in acid rain? Not all sulfur removed, that's totally possible. If it is, the nitrogen from the, from the air reacts with oxygen to form nitrogen oxides. These react with water to form acid rain. Four marks, that's a lovely one, that one. Next, our oh, good old industrial chemistry appearing again. Nice repeat, vaporized crude oil. Feed vapor into tower. Tower has a temperature gradient, hotter at the bottom, warmer at the top. Bigger molecules have bigger, have higher boiling points due to stronger weakened molecular forces. Bigger molecules condense lower down in the tower. Done. In step two, saturated compounds of dodecane are a mixture of hydrocarbons in the diesel fraction. Explain what is meant by the term saturated hydrocarbon. Three marks. Saturated. Dodecane contains no carbon, carbon, double bonds. Hydrocarbon. It is made from only carbon and hydrogen. Give the one that's an alkane, double it and add two. Give this was quite a nice one. They gave you 12 carbons and four had been spat out. You just had to add up all the rest and then four H four C's and eight H's. Take them away from the originals and get your product. To get reaction one to occur, the chlorine with an alkane, we need UV light. Give the juju the compound X, you always make an acid as a byproduct. 
dot and cross diagrams appearing. Everybody knows that in reality, the bit that's interesting is the chlorine. Everyone will forget the extra electrons on the chlorine. Do watch out. I drew a stick version and then translated it to dot and cross. Next. What type of reaction is shown in equation one? I assume equation one was uh, an alkane plus one, so it's a substitution reaction. Uh, propion and bromine water, the orange will turn colorless. A good old empirical formula. I think I'm going to run a uh, calculations webinar probably in the next coming weeks. Name the monomer. Isn't that interesting? See, look, they're asking you to name This is a halo alkene. Isn't that interesting? So I needed to draw that. Two carbons. It's a double bond between it. One has a H and one. Isn't that interesting? So that, 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 that's what I mean by the halo group. So this is chloroethene. Name the polymer that it's used to make. Polychloroethane, otherwise commonly known as PVC. So draw the monomer used to make Teflon. Just put the double bond back and get rid of those guys. So tetrafluoroethene, there's that picture. And the last bit was to make my polyester. They gave us a dioic. Oh, my laptop is really, really struggling. It's just got really, really hot and it's freaking out a little bit. The last question on the paper, they gave us a dioic and they gave us a diol. So here's our dioic. Here's our diol, and what they wanted us to do is to draw the polymer. Remove water twice. Now, you can see how I've done it. Now, the acids lose the H+. Plus. So the H goes, and the H goes from the acids. But now we need to make two waters, so we need an OH, and that comes from the alcohol. Both the OH, and you can see the polymer at the end. We've lost the H, and we've lost the OH of the alcohols. That brings us to the end of our webinar. I am going to do, I know, I know folks <clears throat> that I've skipped the polymer section. It, I have not forgotten. Uh, stop sharing. Oh, thanks for staying so long, guys. I know it's 20 past eight. I really appreciate you guys hanging around. I hope you found it useful. You've been through an awful lot of organics this evening and a mammoth amount really more than I'd probably want to really do in a lesson. But I will do a, uh, a season three webinar before your exams on polymers. I'll try and get as much in as I can. But guys, it's been lovely to hang out with you guys. Thanks so much for watching. I hope you found it useful. See you tomorrow, folks. All right, bye.